Ladies and gentlemen, making his comedy debut for you this evening, please welcome to the stage Mr. Steve Harden. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming out this evening. Uh, on behalf of Pete Storm and myself and the Wally Playhouse, we want to thank you very much for coming out on a cold evening, especially in packing out the Raleigh Playhouse, especially in light of the fact of all of the other cultural and entertainment opportunities that you guys had in Beckley, West Virginia this evening. We really want to thank you for coming and spending it with us. Hey, if, that, uh, if the guy sounded familiar there that uh, introduced himself, Yep, that was me. I knew I was just a warm-up act, but they didn't tell me about until about five minutes ago that I had to introduce myself. So I'm kind of curious if, if you guys wouldn't mind. Would you mind if we took a mulligan on that and I had a do-over? Would that be okay with you guys? I want to I wanna give another shot at that. So I, I'm just going to go backstage. Do me a favor and just, just act like you haven't seen me, okay? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, just getting back from his world tour, a man whose first comedy album shot straight to platinum. Please put your hands together and let's welcome to the stage Mr. Steve Harden. you guys. Now, what do you think? That, that second one, that's a little bit better? Yeah. Is, that, is that better? Actually, that was going to be my theme music when I made it into the MMA as the ultimate fighter champion. But um, I, uh, I could just always envision myself coming down that long, I don't know, I mean, you watch MMA, coming down that long corridor, I'd be in that silk robe, you know, my entourage around me and that music playing. And then I realized, you know what? I'm a lover, not a fighter. And my wife will tell you, I stink at loving, and I'm worse at fighting. So I figured I'd better stick to the comedy gig. You know, it's kind of an odd age uh, to, to try to get a career like this started. But um, hey, before we get started, there's a couple of uh, items that I gotta go over. I guess this falls on me as the warm-up back. Just a few housekeeping items. First of all, this, this is a list that the theater gave me of all the topics that I cannot talk about this evening because of political correctness and we don't want to offend anyone. I really didn't get a chance to read over it that much. I did try to peruse it to uh, cover myself a little bit. Uh, the, the gist of it is, uh, this evening I can't uh, make fun of you unless you're a white, Christian, heterosexual male. The rest of you are safe. And this... This is the list of things I can't talk about because my mom's in the audience. <laughs> hey, on a serious note, I am trying to kind of get this comedy thing off the ground. I'm going to have a table out after the show. If you guys could do me a favor, if you wouldn't mind, I've got some CDs out there I'm going to be selling. It would help me out tremendously. If you guys wouldn't mind buying these, it would help defray at least some of my costs. I got the best of the flock of seagulls. Gordon Lightfoot's greatest hits. And, uh, oh, this is a good one. Frankie Goes to Hollywood's only hit. For you Frankie Goes to Hollywood fans, that's just a joke. Relax. Uh, speaking of people in the audience, uh, my best buddy from junior high is in the audience tonight. His name's Jim. I call him Jimmy. He's probably uh, sweating bullets right now. He didn't know he was going to be in the act. But uh, I got to hold on to his friendship. He's the only guy that's known me that long and still likes me. But um, Jimmy told me the other day, he said, you know what, Steve? He said, I should get into the show for free. He said, I've heard all your material, and you know what? He's right. He has. The reason being, I use Jimmy as a springboard for my comedy. I'll be driving down the road and have a new idea. I call him up, and I say, I say, Jimmy, 
Is this funny? Can I use this in my show? The problem with that is that Jimmy laughs at anything and everything I say. He's not a real good barometer for my comedy. So if this stuff isn't funny this evening, we've got one person to blame, Jimmy. You know, it is an odd age to try to launch a second career. I'm 52 years old. That's when I realized it might be a little easier to break into comedy than to become the UFC fighting champion. But um, I got a feeling because, because of my age, I'm not old, but I'm not young. So I have a feeling that half the audience tonight is going to be going, what is he talking about? The other half is going to be going, what in the world is he talking about? <laughs> you know, uh, I grew up in West Virginia. My parents moved back to West Virginia when I was about four years old. I went to uh, Marshall University. I did graduate, by the way. Nobody should mention that. I uh, heard a few hurt fans this evening. Uh, so I graduated from Marshall. I moved back to Beckley. I'm married to a girl from Beckley. So I certainly consider myself a Southern West Virginia native. And like many of you, most of you probably, you get tired of hearing the West Virginia jokes and all of the stereotypes about West Virginia. So I've been kind of on a little personal crusade to try to set the record straight on that. I tell people, dude, this is the 21st century. You can't use the H word. You can't call us hillbillies. That's offensive. We prefer the term Appalachian Americans. You know, I also tell people, we didn't all grow up in trailers. We didn't all drive Camaros around. And for heaven's sake, I didn't marry my first cousin. It's an interesting uh, story. Uh, one of my good friends did marry my first cousin. I mean, I was going to ask her out, but my Camaro was up on blocks in the trailer park at the time. So I don't know how many of you might have grown up with that mechanically minded father like I did. Let me set the record straight. My dad is my hero. He can build or repair just about anything you can imagine. Let me give you an example of that. And this is a true story. Years ago, he got an idea that he was going to restore an old Buick. So over 12 years, he tore this car down from beginning to end, all by himself. He's taken that uh, car all over uh, most of America, and he's won national awards with it. Not only that, then he built the very garage that he stores the car in. You know, it's a good day at my household if I plug in a lamp and I don't blow the breaker. <laughs> But growing up with, uh, with a, a dad like that was a little bit challenging. I would come home from school and I'd be like, Mom and Dad, I need to buy a, a toy sword. I got the lead part in a play at school, King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table. My dad would chime in, buy a sword? Come out here in the garage, son, I'll build you a sword. That was my dad's answer to everything. Come out here in the garage, son. So sure enough, the next day, here I go, I'm nine years old. I'm dragging a 12 foot, 12 pound, five foot long Claymore sword to school. As Soon as I get there, they send me home. My parents want to know why. I'm like, dad, you sent me to school with a lethal weapon. So Saturday morning rolls around and I'm doing what every kid my age on Saturday morning in that era did. I'm watching Saturday morning cartoons. My dad comes in the house. He says, come out here in the garage, son. You might learn something. I said, dad, I'm learning something right here. I'm learning whether Shaggy and Scooby are going to figure out this week's mystery. You know, looking back, that show really didn't leave a lot to the imagination if you think about it. It's the same old storyline. The guy they saw at the front of the show was the guy by the end of the show. They pulled the mask off of him and he always said the same thing. I would have gotten away with it if you hadn't been for you meddling kids. <laughs> Now, I don't know about you, but this didn't really look like a crackpot crew of crime fighters to me. I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer, and I'd like to think I could pull a thing or two over on them. I think we ought to send them over to South Korea and deal with Kim Jong-un. You know why? I'd love to hear that interview. I would have gotten away with it, had it not been for you pesky kids. That's exactly how Kim Jong-un sounds, by the way, in case you're wondering. It's also exactly why I don't do impressions of my show. <laughs> that was the greatest impression of the little rocket man I've ever heard, and everybody knows it. <laughs> so Saturday, I do go out in the garage, but I don't learn anything. The only thing I ever learned was how to hold the light, and I didn't do that right. Not like that, son. You're holding it in my eye. Just go back in the house which is where I wanted to be in the first place. 
But I didn't get back in time to figure out what that week's mystery was and if Shaggy and Scooby were able to figure it out. The good news for me, I did get back in time, however, to figure out just exactly what Conjunction Junction's function was. <laughs> you know, speaking of Saturday morning cartoons, here's another one on this side of things that really doesn't make a lot of sense to us as adults, the Roadrunner. I mean, that coyote chased that skinny bird all over the desert. I'm thinking, why in the world didn't he just call up Acme and order a bird? And you know they would have had it. I mean, any company that's got nine miles of railroad track and a rocket sled or a giant horseshoe magnet could have hooked him up with some frozen bird. You know that. But you know, if you think about it, Acme was the Amazon of, of that day. I mean, you could order anything and get it in any time. And it got me thinking, that's probably where Jeff Bezos got the idea for Amazon. Think about it. He's 54, I'm 52. We're probably watching the same Saturday morning cartoons. He gets the idea, he sees that. He thinks that's a good model. But you know, that's about where the parallels between me and Jeff Bezos end. I mean, Amazon's worth $130 billion. I'm doing stand-up comedy for you guys in Beckley, West Virginia this year. You know, my dad did instill in me the love of cars. I do love the old cars, especially the muscle car era, if you guys grew up with that. You know, and what did we have back then, guys? We had the Mustang Cobra and the Mach 1. You know, the, the uh, Barracuda and the Plymouth Fury. What do we have today? The Nissan Leaf. <laughs> the Murano. Really? It's got more on right in the name. I'm like, how did they come up with that name? Was El Stupido taken that day? I'm not sure. But you know my favorite? My favorite car is the Toyota Prius. How many here drive a Toyota? Let me rephrase that. How many of you here drive a Toyota Prius and are brave enough to tell the rest of us about it? My God, that's the ugliest car I think I've ever seen. You know, you got to love the liberals saving the planet for the rest of us. Which is not a bad thing, really, because my Ford F-250 gets about nine miles to the gallon on a good day. I need someone offset my carbon footprint. I don't want to feel guilty when that last polar bear dies up there in the Antarctic. You know, I saw a Prius one time. It's a true story. I saw a Prius driving around with a personalized license plate. That's a joke in and of itself, but I'm not going there. Like I said, I'm Dave's. Ladies, if we find ourselves dating each other and you drive a Prius, do me a favor. Don't advertise that on a personalized license plate. It's not because I'm married and I'm afraid someone's going to figure out that I'm having an affair. I just don't want anybody to know I'm having an affair with somebody who drives a Prius. I got morals. I'll tell you, you can always tell a hippie by the car they drive, can't you? It's usually a Subaru Outback. See it all the way down the road, and uh, they've got so many bumper stickers over that back window, they can't even see to back up. You know, one of those stickers always says, uh, coexist. You know what the other one always says? Buy local. Yeah, they're driving a Japanese car telling me to buy local. You ever been in a hurry and try to fuel up your car up, play that 20 questions at the pump? Would you like a receipt? No. Would you like a car wash? No. Are you a member of our rewards program? No. Would you like to become a member of our rewards program? No, I, I'd like to get some gas. Have you got one on there that says, would you like to get gas? Coaches? So I can push yes on that, and we can move this ball on down the road. I'll tell you, the other thing about driving, I drive a lot with my job. I'm in sales. This is one thing you ever notice. You guys ever notice motorcycle drivers? They must be the coolest guys in the world. They'll be going down the road, one going one way, one the other. They always give anybody, give each other that cool motorcycle way. Sometimes the vet drivers give each other the vet way, or the Jeep drivers may give each other a Jeep way. Never see two guys in a minivan doing that, do you? <laughs> nope, they're hunkered down over that steering wheel, got their hat pulled down, their shades all praying. Nobody sees them going to Walmart. Here's another thing. I was on the turnpike the other day, saw that car up there in the left-hand lane, not getting over, going slow. I bet no one in this room knows where that car was from. Ohio! You got it, Ohio. But you know what really made that bad? They had a bumper sticker that said, what would Jesus do? Now, I'm not smart enough to claim to know what Jesus would do, 
But I'm going to venture a guess. I know what Jesus wouldn't do. He wouldn't hang out in that left-hand lane. Make me pass him on the right-hand lane and lose my religion in the process. I'll tell you another thing. Cars have gotten way, just way too advanced. My Ford Edge is a company vehicle. It's got that Ford Sync system. You guys probably have something like that in your Priuses. I don't know. But you talk to your car. It's artificial intelligence. You know, intelligence is a subjective term right there. Let me give you an example. My wife's name is Kim. I'm driving down the road. I'm like, tell my car, call Kim at home. My car says, call Tim Malone? I'm like, no, call Kim at home. Leave Kim alone? I'm like, no, call Kim at home. Call Kim a hoe? No, I forget about it. Calling Kim at home. <laughs> Thank you very much. Hey, um, I really appreciate that. Hey, I hope you guys enjoyed Pete as much as I did. Put your hands together again for Pete Stewart and Sean Cass. And let me tell you, I really want to offer a sincere word of thanks to uh, Pete for making this happen for me. This really has been a lifelong dream of mine to uh, try to do stand-up. Uh, I thought I better get on it at 52 years old. Uh, time's passing me by. But all the material you hear here this evening, it's all original. I wrote it all, I choreographed it all. So you can only imagine the kind of pressure that's on you guys tonight to laugh at me. I mean, you don't strike me as the kind of crowd that would want to crush an old man's dreams. So uh, <laughs> something I started thinking about backstage, and this is not part of my act. I'm sure my wife's out there thinking, please don't go off script this evening. But uh, when we were thinking about cell phones, I thought about something that was been a while back. And it was in church, actually. And uh, somebody's cell phone went off right as the preacher's preaching. And you know, that wouldn't be bad enough, but you know what the ringtone was? ACDC's Highway to Hell. <laughs> I'm thinking, really? If your cell phone's going to go off in church and you're going to have a rock and roll song as your ringtone, don't you think it should at least be Led Zeppelin's Stairway to Heaven? I don't know if you noticed the theme. I don't know if any of you are movie buffs, but all three of those songs that I had to play as I came out here, does anybody know who that was? Van Halen. Van Halen, thank you, someone, yeah. I, I uh, It's kind of interesting because I started listening. I just kind of like they have long intros, and I thought that would be kind of cool to play. But I'm pretty sure I heard my dad in the audience say, turn down that rock and roll music. <laughs> oh, my goodness, my dad hates my music to this day. Says he doesn't understand it. I'd like to think I learned a few things listening to my music. I mean, I did learn a little bit of foreign language. Don't worry, gato, Mr. Robata. Translation, thank you very much, Mr. Robot. You know, Dad, I'm still trying to figure out just exactly what ba 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 You know, I do like, I still listen to the old music that I listened to growing up. I still like that. But you know, as you get older, you listen to it a little differently. Let me give you an example. You guys remember the old song by the players, Baby Come Back? Yeah. Baby Come Back? Yeah. You can blame it all on me. I was wrong, and I just can't live without you. You know, guys, how many of you here have been married for more than five minutes? You know she's going to blame it on you, whether you give her permission to or not. And chances are you can live without them, as long as you want to do that with half your stuff. <laughs> Here's another song that, uh, you guys remember the hair band Scorpions? Anybody remember the hair band Scorpions? They had a song called Rock You Like a Hurricane. Wow, Rock You Like a Hurricane. That's a pretty bold statement if you think about it. My wife says about the best I ever do is a tropical depression. Here's another song. You guys remember Kiss? Kiss's anthem? I want to rock and roll all night. Wow, that was good. I thought I was going to have to bring the mic back and do that again. Let's try that again. You guys did a good job. I want to rock and roll all night. See, the key word there is want. I want to rock and roll all night. But that's kind of hard to do when I fall asleep in my recliner at 9.30 in my boxer shorts. 
a little bit of drool running down my face and a half-eaten bag of Doritos on my belly. And you know what? If I could rock and roll all night, I can't party every day. I got a little something the next day to go to called a job. I don't know who signed me up for that. I guess that's what happens when you listen to four grown men dressed up like space aliens and a cat. But maybe, maybe my favorite song that I listen to differently is probably a song that most of you don't know by its actual title. We know the song by something completely different. Does anybody here know what the, know what, we know the song Escape to, does any, Pina Colada song, losers. Uh, but yeah, we know that as the Pina Colada song. If you want Pina Coladas, getting caught in the rain. If you're not into health food, if you have half a brain, you know the story there. Well, for those of you that don't remember the story, maybe you're too old to know that story or too young to know what in the world I'm talking about, let me bring you up to speed. It's a guy and a girl, they're in a relationship, and it's kind of falling into a rut. So the guy says he's sitting in bed one night, he's reading the newspaper, and he reads this personal ad. Now let me stop right there, if there are any millennials in the audience, and let me just clear things up. The newspaper was a paper that had news on it. Actually it came to our house every day, we got to read that. And the personal ads, well, that's your version of Tinder. Okay, are you with me? Okay, so anyway, the guy reads this ad that this girl puts in there that she likes asking if you like pina coladas. So he answers, and in the song he says, I didn't think about my old lady. I know that sounds kind of mean, but me and my old lady had fallen into the same old dull routine. So I picked up a paper and took out a personal ad, and though I'm nobody's poet, I thought it wasn't half bad. You know, Rupert Holmes, when he wrote that song, man, that, he was a bad poet. I tell you what, that's a terrible song. But anyway, so they uh, plan their escape. They're going to meet at a bar called O'Malley's. O'Malley's. Yeah, good crowd. They're going to meet at a bar called O'Malley's, and they're going to plan their escape. So the guy gets there first. Imagine that, the woman's late. <laughs> I didn't see that coming, did you guys? So the guy gets there, the girl walks in, they lock eyes, and they know instantly they recognize each other. And she says, oh, I never knew that you liked pina coladas. Yeah, that's how that would go down at the Harden household. <laughs> Guys, do me a favor. When you go home tonight, take out a profile on Tinder and get back to me. Let me know how that goes. You know, my wife and I, this is, this. I can't make this up. It's some of the stuff you can't make up. I'm not that smart. We were uh, cross-country skiing one time up at Canaan Valley, a place called um, White Grass. And if you've ever crossed country ski, it's a little bit different than downhill. I mean, you work all day. You ski up the mountain, then you ski down the mountain, then you ski up the mountain. And, and so we were tired. We'd skied all day. We were tired. We were hungry. We got back. We were staying at the lodge up there. And when we got back, the only place that was really available to us was a little, I don't know, restaurant sandwich place downstairs. So we thought, well, that's what we've got for food. Well, when we got down there, there was a young guy. He had his uh, DJ stand set up, had the smoke and the lights and the mixing station. And I told my wife, I said, you know, that looks a whole lot like the guy that was flipping our omelets this morning down at the breakfast buffet. I think he was moonlighting as a DJ. And you know, if you guys have ever heard mixed music, some of you are like, what in the world is mixed music? If you've ever heard mixed music, you know, usually there's a rhyme or a reason to it, or there's some segue. Not with this guy. I'll give you an example of kind of what it was like. Well, you can tell by the way I get my walk. I'm a woman's man and no time to talk. Thank God I'm a country boy. Well, I got me a song and I got me a fiddle. And the sun's coming up. I got cakes on the griddle. Life ain't nothing but a funny fun a riddle. Thank God. I can't believe you guys missed it. That's why I don't turn the show over to amateurs. Talk about night fever, night fever. So uh, anyway, I'll tell you something else that's changed a lot. By show of hands... How many here had or know what I'm talking about when I talk about the Atari Pong video game? You guys know that? Yeah. It was, for those of you who don't know, it was one digital paddle on this side of a 13-inch TV and one paddle on this side of a 13-inch TV and a digital tennis ball going across the stage. You're going to have more fun going outside watching the paint dry. 
<laughs> but I would like to think that we pro progressed a little bit and we graduated because then we got to the point where we would actually go into the arcade and play what I feel are truly some of the classic games like Frogger and Pac-Man and, and uh, Space Invaders, things like that. Now, nowadays, these gamers, they actually have a chair. They have chairs made just for gaming. They have, they have this virtual reality uh, glasses on and this elaborate headset. And this is true, they can literally game, they can play games with anybody, any world, anywhere in the world. The interesting thing is, anytime you see their commercials for their games on TV, they say rated M for mature. I got a newsflash for you. You're 32 years old, living in mom and dad's basement and playing video games, you probably ain't mature. You know, my, uh, my wife and I are different. You'll notice some of these jokes don't have a segue. I just like right into them. <laughs> my wife and I are a lot different. I bet you didn't know you were going to have that kind of knowledge dropped on you this evening that men and women are different. But uh, my wife loves the Lifetime movies. Ladies, you like the Lifetime movies? How many of you out there? You know the Lifetime channel? I tell you what, you would think with a, 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 a name like Lifetime right there in the title that this would be kind of a romantic comedy or have a happy ending or something like that? No. I'm going to tell you, somebody's dying by the end of that show. I'll tell you something else. If you're an actor and you find yourself on the Lifetime channel, your career is officially dead. Hey, honey, wasn't that Danny Bonaducci I just saw on that last episode? You know, a lot of people say that uh, uh, men don't like to shop, that of course, we're different in that, but I don't agree with that. You take a man to Lowe's and drop him off, he can spend hours and probably thousands of dollars in Lowe's. As a matter of fact, I'm convinced that Lowe's is the only place in the world that you can go that the men's room is actually more crowded than the women's room. We were in Lowe's the other day. We got to the checkout counter. And there was a stud finder in my bu bucket there in my basket, and I said, honey, we have a stud finder. She said, no, this one's for me. <laughs> you know, my wife likes to shop at Sam's. You guys like to shop at Sam's Club? And why not? We all know about the impending toilet paper shortage that's coming up. My wife figures she's got a corner of the market on toilet paper, and I think we've done a pretty good job of that. You know, that's an interesting store if you think about it. You've got to buy a membership for the privilege to get to shop at their store. Then you have to pass your commercial driver's license to drive that buggy around the store. I was in there the other day, took a corner too close, hit a support beam, and had to shut the store down for about 20 minutes while I fixed the place. You know, my wife once bought two gallons. This is a true story. She bought two gallons of vanilla at Sam's. Ladies, have you ever noticed how infrequently you use vanilla in a recipe? And when you do, if it's ever more than a quarter of a teaspoon, I don't know what you're making. But we've got enough of this stuff to spill a small hot tub, I tell you what. But our kids are happy about it. We put it in our wheel, we pass it down to them. They figure they've got something to remember us by long after we're gone. You know, uh, a lot of people... They ask me, it's like, where do you get material? And I think, I, I don't know. I, I mean, I guess I just see things a little differently sometimes. i give you an example. You'll see this. You guys may have seen this, especially if you're driving past an older graveyard. There's a sign on there that says perpetual care. I'm like, how much care do these people need? Maybe they had better care, they wouldn't have ended up there in the first place. I saw this on TV the other day. It was a promo for the Dr. Phil show said one in 10 Americans is addicted to drugs. What they don't tell you is that nine out of those 10 got addicted to drugs after I after watch the Dr. Phil show. <laughs> Here's my favorite. This is a true story. I was at a meeting one time, a bunch of us were gonna go out to eat. As we were going to the restaurant, we passed a restaurant that said Ethiopian cuisine. I'm like, think about that. What is their tagline? Come hungry, leave starved? I mean, isn't there a famine going on down there? Quit exporting your food to America. We got enough. You don't believe me? Stop by Walmart on the way home this evening. You know, another place I like to get materials, commercials. They kind of write themselves. Commercials. This is one you hear on the radio every now and then. 
Donate your car for the Heritage for the Blind. I'm glad you guys laughed at that. Some people said, you know, I don't have an old car right now that I'm going to donate, but I'm thinking I'm going to go out and find an old $500 beater. I'm going to tell them I'll donate it on one condition. I get to be there when that guy drives it off the lot. I figure that's the best $500 entertainment money I've spent for a long time. Here's another one. You guys have seen the Ancestry.com. You can get on, on the web and you can look for your family tree. You know what their tagline is? Connect with family you didn't even know you had. I'm like, good Lord, I don't want to connect with the family I know I do have half the time. Here's another one. Rosetta Stone. You guys know Rosetta Stone? You can learn to speak a foreign language. You know, they say it's used by dignitaries, the military, the ambassador, and even NASA. NASA? I'm like, the last time I checked, NASA's going to the moon and Mars. Who do they think we're going to run into up there? And exactly how do they know how to teach us the language to speak? I mean, have they got some Martian guy holed up at Area 51 out there forcing him to teach us to speak his language? Or maybe they've worked out a deal with him. If he'll teach us to speak the language, they'll go easy on him. I can imagine this little Martian guy back there smoking cigarettes, watching Star Trek reruns on the Sci-Fi channel. 